morning, and uh, I'm very delighted to be here today. First, a little disclaimer. English is not my native tongue, so um, probably I will be saying things that uh, you might not sort of understand or you would think differently about. Maybe I will occasionally offend someone. That is not intended, but it can happen. So um, I am going to talk about the meaning and roles of the public libraries uh, in the network society. And my speech will have four sort of parts. Uh, first one would be sort of contemplating about the future. Second, about innovative services. Third, about library as a space. And then I'll talk a little bit about the new main library in Aarhus that is coming, that will be inaugurated in, by the end of 2014. So why don't we start by saying that Denmark is a small nation, uh, ab about one million larger in terms of inhabitants than New Zealand. Um, the average spending on libraries is about 95, 96 New Zealand dollars per year. We have an average, uh, a lending average per capita of about 13.8 which I believe, that I believe that New Zealand is about 12.8 something. I read that in your strategical report. Um, I come from uh, Aarhus, which is um, this red dot in the middle of Jutland, a city of about 300,000 inhabitants. We have 19 libraries and we, ha we are below uh, the average spending in Denmark on libraries. This is Aarhus. Welcome to Aarhus. Aarhus is not the biggest city in Europe. We're not even the biggest city in Denmark. But we like to think big, and we have big ambitions. One of them is becoming European capital of culture in 2017. Culture has contributed to making Aarhus a modern, lively, and vibrant city. But now it's time to rethink. Rethink Aarhus. Rethink what culture can do for Aarhus and for Europe. We have high concentration of creative companies. Aarhus is home to some of the world's best and internationally renowned architectural companies. Art and architecture have always played an important role in the city, such as the town hall designed by famous architects Arne Jacobsen and Erik Müller. It is a Danish landmark of functionalist architecture. Since then, new landmarks have been created the latest is Olaf Eliasson's impressive Your Rainbow Panorama on top of the Museum of Art. Your Rainbow Panorama rethinks both art and the city's urban spaces. It gives us a new perspective on things and is an example of how art can change and increase the pride of belonging to a city. More projects are on the way. In a few months, a new production center for the performing arts, literature and visual arts opens, and the building of a library of the future is underway. In many ways, urban media space Aarhus will set the standards for future libraries worldwide. Aarhus is a regional magnet for cultural tourism. The city's museum have a high international standard and attract people from the entire world. Becoming European cultural capital is one of the tools to help Aarhus stay an attractive city where people want to live and work. Rethink is more than a theme for this project. It's a lifestyle and a mindset. It's the future for Aarhus and Europe. Rethink with Aarhus. Well, you notice that the library was one of the, one of the parts of this video that is used by the city council to promote Aarhus uh, internationally. So the library plays a big role in the thinking of Aarhus. Well, let's return to what a library is. Well, libraries are or was in the industrial society about democracy, education, and culture. They still are. And they were a big success in Denmark, at least. In Scandinavia, actually, 
also in England, US, New Zealand. A lot of places, the public libraries have, have had a tremendous role to play in the industrial society. But the big societal changes now, they are, where I come from, about democracy. We have a lot of new citizens coming in and have had that for at least a generation. We have a demographical, some call it challenge. Uh, we are getting older in general, which is good, but also poses some challenges because not all of us are very fit when we get old. In Denmark, we are now 30% fewer young people than when I was a young man. That, that is a big problem, actually. And, of course, we also have the problem with the social excluded. Although we are a very wealthy nation, we still have 40% of the labor force that has no vocational education. That was good, or no problem, rather, before the big crisis set in in 2008 because a lot of these people were uh, occupied in the building businesses, but now it's a big problem. Still, 20% of the young people don't get education beyond secondary school. We have a big part of the population who are actually illiterate, 15 to 20%. That's the same in all European countries. Some won't admit it, but it's the case. So you could say that in society there is a strong, big gap between those who can handle and understand and manage information and those who can't. In Denmark, we are a lot fewer libraries now than we were way back in the late uh, 70s and eight, beginning of 80s. We have had more than 50% of decrease of physical service point. We are now down to 450 libraries. When we were at the top, we had more than 1,200 points. Most of these libraries that have been closed, they are very small, I admit. They, they would be very small. Still, it is a tremendous change in the infrastructure of libraries. And of course, we have the same challenge as everywhere else. The e-book, the digitization is really coming on strong now. And just to keep that in mind, we are now in year 17 after World Wide Web. Imagine year 17 after the invention of the car. At that time, the biggest problem in the infrastructure in New York was to how to get rid of the horse dung. You, you, you would still go with the bill before the car. Think what happens to the infrastructure because of the car in society. I can see in your city, they wouldn't exist without cars. In the, in, the, in the way that they look. I mean, they are very flat and very, very widespread. So digitization will have the same profound impact on the way that we organize society. We have just seen the beginning of it. IT infrastructure is now being rolled out almost all over the world. Uh, bandwidth is coming on. In Denmark, we have a high-speed commission, so-called, and we will have 100 megabytes to all rural areas within a very short time. That kind of thing. Our citizens are increasingly becoming consumers. They also express their political views through their consumption. Very self-reliant. They demand quality. They don't have very much time. All these changes pose enormous challenges to the operation model of the traditional library. And we have all, all experienced that, I'm sure, in the way that we need to provide services much faster, much more accurate than we used to. And there's a big party of the users that are not very satisfied and sometimes very, very rude, which is also a relatively new situation. There's no respect for the authorities and people will express themselves about it. There's things to be done about that. In Denmark, a guy like Paul Nikolangi, he would really gain respect in the libraries. This is, I knew this wouldn't go down well here, but this guy, 
he looks very scary for a Danish person just by the looks. And he would really, he would, there would be no trouble around him. I'm sure. <laughs> Competence development. Uh, in Denmark, we have a relatively average, relatively high average age of uh, library employees. And uh, which is very good, but we need to do something about it also. Very, very soon, everything will change because a lot of librarians are my age. So within the next five to eight years, they will retire. And that will make a tremendous change in our culture. And of course, there is this problem of money. We have to do much more for much less in Denmark, at least. I probably, uh, it's probably the same here. We used to have a strategy about that, but it won't work. I don't know what that thing is doing. We have no more money. We will have less. So we need to think about what we can do about that. We need to reinvent the library. We need to think differently. New ways of professionalism, new products, new alliances, new ways of funding the library. Or else we might as, as well sit down and pray and hope for the best. But if we talk about change, how can we change? There are different strategies. This change won't work. You can't stay the same and grow big. The other way won't work either. You can't sort of just be what you are and then turn smaller in the library. A self-supporting change, you grow old, you mature, and then eventually this will happen. <laughs> we need to think differently. As you all know, there has been this very broadly publicized uh, extension timeline where they say that the libraries will not be here in 2020. So will, will that be true? It is really up to us. W you could say that we are in the position of where we need to move the library from analog media and very transactional thinking. The user comes into a physical library, they borrow a book, it is, it is uh, lent out in a transactional way. Wh what we need to do is to be much more relational, we need to think much more about the digital media and how to present them and, and use them. Now in Denmark, uh, two years ago, we published a strategy uh, about uh, the public libraries in the knowledge-based society. There were three major parts that were really uh, strongly emphasized. One was to establish the Danish digital library. The other one was a new mental thinking model for what a library is. And the third recommendation, strong recommendation in this uh, strategy report was to make partnerships. So first I'll just talk a little bit about libraries on the net, the Danish digital library, which was one of these recommendations. The basic idea of this Danish digital library is to liberate data and information from where it's embedded and create relations between data. In this process also to make the user's knowledge visible and useful in the service provision and to place the information in a meaningful context for the user. In this, we would use open source software and we will and have formed communities for development of these services. It sounds very fuzzy. Think about information as put in silos. You have the databases that contains a lot of uh, information, you have various kinds of e-resources, e-books, web page, and so on. All these information silos can be broken down 
So the, here's the technical concept. We have all the data sources on the left-hand side. Then we have a data repository, which is actually a bunch of servers that, that harvest these data based on the metadata. We'll put in the metadata in the data repository. And then we have this application layer where we have the APIs that are small program pieces that will direct the data out where the users are in the presentation layer. This is called the service-oriented architecture. W and it's extremely important to think about the IT infrastructure and to command the IT infrastructure for the libraries. Then we can pick up the user's transactions in a statistical manner. Uh, the users, they behave various in various ways and that data on behavioral uh, on behavior can be picked up and used to uh, present data in various formats and ways for the users. So this is sort of the general concept. The way we organize ourselves and the communities around this, this uh, infrastructure is that we have an open source community about this. We have a lot of library partners, we have a lot of vendor partners, uh, and we do projects. Uh, we have a council uh, that meets around this. So it's a totally self-organized sort of community. This is, again, the technical setup. I won't go into that again. So that gives you a brief idea on the in infrastructure. What can we build on that? We have built a lot of so-called net library subject portals. We have this, uh, it's called library DK, which is a system uh, holding uh, an ordering, search and ordering uh, system for physical items. So when you are a user of any library in Denmark, you can place an order on any book that is, or any other item that is held in any library in Denmark and have it delivered to that library near you. That's an old service. We have the fiction literature portal, which is the most used uh, by far in Denmark. Also an old service, uh, but now really developed into an enormous uh, cooperation also with the nationwide public service TV and radio. Contains a lot of different services and uh, is hugely popular. One of the funny thing is that it uh, also has a lot of uh, it has a lot of uh, readers clubs in the physical world connected to it. So, eighty six libraries cooperate. We have more than three million visits, unique visits per year, on that service. We have a children's service called Palace Bis Gift Shop. The idea is to create a kind of a universe where we have some basic figures that are sort of cartoon figures and they have each their character. We change the themes all the time and they are recognizable also in the physical libraries. This is how the homepage looks. It's a different presentation all the time. Themes changes every month. There's a lot of recommendations and music and games to be downloaded and you can participate in polling and download the figures. You can comment and there's room for library apps and so on. These are the pictures. And this is from the main library in, in, in Aarhus. So you can see again some of the services is to be found around. Bitsum is a musical service. Uh, you can uh, download more than uh, nine, actually more now, more, more than 10 million tracks. It's not like Freegal here. We have the Freegal service where you can, a user can download three, uh, I think, songs per week and then see them. This is based on a digital right management system. So the user can download a lot of music, but uh, it will erase itself after a week. 
download of games for PCs, movies for download, watch movies with your BIOS card, with your on-demand. E-sound books uh, for downloads has been extremely uh, popular. And the relatively newest one is the e-book shelf, also a downloadable um, e-book service based on DRM. Um, Adobe and EPUB format, that will also erase itself after a week. And then you can, if you want to, you can buy the book through the same system. Our OPEC has a lot of services, very interactive. Um, and one of the best things about the library OPEC now, when they are made in this open source system that we call Tink, which is sort of the infrastructure for the Danish digital library, we can put in all the content of these portals from films or movies, e-music, e-sound books and e-books. So that would, that would be invisible for the user. The user that uses the OPEC will just get the film or the e-book, the e-content. When they search in the library's OPEC, if the library has access to that service, then the, the actual film will come up for the user when they search it and click on it. Of course, there's uh, also uh, all kinds of uh, mobile services connected to the system, again, based on the same IT infrastructure. We can use the loan patterns, the behavior of the user to sort of generate services like others who have borrowed this book have also borrowed the book below based on statistical ranking, just as you know it from Amazon. We can syndicate. That means that we can take e-content, use web service technologies and put it out into other web pages. For instance, uh, we do it a lot with the uh, secondary schools and uh, uh, sort of higher education uh, web pages, we put in stuff, e-relevant stuff for the students. So the students will use the library service where they are on the net, on their institution web pages. This uh, e-book service in Danish, e-reolen, e-bookshelf, was uh, started last year, and we have, uh, now we cover about 80% of the ebook market. Built on this uh, e-content e structure, and uh, we launched it on all platforms. This is how it looked in the main library in Aarhus. Put it on all kinds of Place and, uh, and did a lot of uh, training of the users to download in their EPUB. In Aarhus, it's prohibited on public buildings to put banners, but we can put them inside the building. <laughs> this is an uh, electronic uh, pylons that are just in the outskirts of the city where we advertise. So this was the first part of my presentation. Now I want you to turn to each other and comment and say, is, is, this, is this at all relevant for you? Is it meaningful or is it totally rubbish being from your point of view? You have three minutes for that from now.
actually, actually, I lied to you. I lied to you. You only had two minutes, and they are gone now. So, uh, just a brief interruption about what, it, what uh, innovation is. When, when we think about innovation, it must be something new, and it must have something of value for the user. So innovation in a library context is of value for the user. There has been a lot of theory about uh, what innovation is, and one model is to think about uh, this from this destruction to control. And if you really want to be innovative or try to be innovative, you must navigate between chaos and control, but not go into the destruction mode. Um, there's a lot of talk about the phases of innovation. One model is that you think about the divergence and the convergence phase that you run through in uh, innovation process. So in the divergent phase, you sort of unfold the ideas and in the convergent phase, you put them together. In the divergent phase, you know something about what you are going to innovate about. And then you know there's something you don't know. You know the areas that you don't know and th that you need to get some knowledge about. And then there's this unknown non-knowledge th that what you don't know that you don't know actually in there. In the uh, converging, converging uh, phase, that is where you make your goals and aims and vision fulfillment and your action plans. That part, in general, we are very good at in the library. We are not always very good at the divergent phase. Between these phases, we have the grown phase. That is when you're desperate. When anything, everything is wrong and you think that you have all experienced that, I'm sure, in various projects. So that's a good thing to carry with you as a, as a model. And then also think about if you have a very short divergent phase, then you will not have a big innovation. Then you will have a small innovation. You need to unfold and really get all the ideas in. Again, if you want a big innovation, you must have a bigger divergent phase. So innovation in libraries. This picture is one of my favorites because th this, is, this is the backside of the main library in Aarhus. And these people, they are, uh, this guy, he's a librarian. This girl, she's a project leader for the building of the ma main library and has a, a humanistic uh, education of some sort. Th that guy, he's a professor on the architectural school. And these guys are working at the IT university. And this guy, he's working for a company. So they are working together on a project in the main library. We have a strategy for innovation, for user-driven innovation. We adapted that in 2007, and that has been a tremendous sort of easy way to keep us on track in our innovation processes. One of the things we have done very much is to try to prototype the future, to build sort of all kinds of projects and devices. We have done a lot of that. And we think a lot about the building as being as intelligent as possible. An old concept was the hybrid, hybrid library where we have multiple user interfaces, where we get intelligent support from the environment, and where we embed elements in the building, in the physical building. A point here is that when I talk to people that seems to know about uh, the IT future, I say seems to know, they, they, they tell me that uh, the user interfaces will be more and more invisible. And to a big extent, that is also true. I mean, your car is talking to you. Uh, you don't have to have uh, keyboards anymore. So you could say that a lot of computing is now more and more embedded in your surrounding. And we try to take that notion and build into the library. Now these are some of the projects. Our eye floor, which actually 
won a Danish Design Award in 2004, where you sort of grab uh, projected images around on the floor where you can pose questions and answer them with your mobile phone. And this info column was a prototype where we tried to sort of show what do we have of digital content in the library. And you could roll this. Uh, this uh, different things would emerge when you roll the sort of the wheel and you could put down your mobile phone. We see it's an old model and you could uh, download the content from this info column. This is our info gallery that we use heavily now. And uh, we can put all kinds of skin on so it can look different. And it gives access to some of the digitized uh, services and web services that we have. You just sort of press it and you know something will come up that hopefully is of interest. And we have done a lot of different skins and, and various furniture that we put it in and, and try to present all kinds of content through that uh, info gallery. Uh, we try to stage the physical library. This is the so-called climate scene. Some of you will remember that in Copenhagen a few years ago, there was this enormous uh, climate uh, conference uh, internationally with all, uh, unfortunately it, it didn't come out well, but uh, we actually broadcast it to more than 100 libraries. We had uh, a journalist that uh, did on the run a lot of uh, broadcasting that was sent out to the libraries and presented in all kinds of formats uh, in the Danish library. Just a little brief video. The Children's Interactive Library Project was carried out by Aarhus Public Library in collaboration with Interactive Spaces. But children of today want to interact, to have influence, and be able to shape their surroundings. Island was a table where children and grown-ups could travel in a balloon over the city of Aarhus and watch historical film clips. The children used balloons and figurines to navigate around the table. Basically, the island was an RFID-enabled table prepared to exhibit any material or information. The table consisted of an interactive screen with RFID equipment. It was activated by moving physical objects around on the table, thereby creating audio-visual effects. Another larger installation of a similar kind has been created displaying a safari theme with wild animals on the savanna. By using RFID technology, pervasive computing, and physical objects, the island can be used as a funny and collaborative tool for children to investigate different topics and, in a playful way, acquire information. The Story Surfer integrated theories on tangible design, pervasive computing, and children's natural urge to explore. It endorsed the use of multiple intelligences. The Story Surfer encouraged children to engage in collaborative search sessions by using their bodies. By integrating pervasive computing, the searching of materials was detached from the traditional keyboard and computer screen. Instead, the Story Surfer used physical objects with which children could search, investigate, and play. The technology in itself was of secondary importance. The central points were user-driven design, user experience, playing, and the concept of an inclusive library service. Yeah, so uh, these are some of the projects that we have done. E-tables and this flip phone was uh, quite funny, actually. So you put the one end up to the book and the book will start talking to you. <laughs> Look at the guy. That was an early version. <laughs> Not good for your neck. Story had PDA equipped, reacts with ISAB text, starts talking to you. Yeah, hearing stories. Laundry game, which is actually an Australian invention. Walking sheep, story chair, also telling stories, there you go, interactive walls. The quibbler, you press that button and words will emerge in not orderly sentences. So the children will put, will put them right. That is actually a good training exercise. And also low tech, 
book tables, still you can be <laughs> inventive. Play is one of the most important ways for our children to express themselves culturally and to create their cultural identities as children. Families at Play in the Library has worked with bringing play into the physical library and especially with how the whole family can be inspired to play together. This film presents the project's most important lessons learned. Media and toys play an essential role in children's socialization and therefore games and playwear are a necessary and important part of the library's activities. Create playrooms or areas that appeal and inspire to play. Two staged and rigorous environments can be intimidating to the users. An environment with many possibilities to play, which appeals to both the senses and physical activities, work better than structured play that needs introductions to the rules. Families start playing much easier when they immediately see the possibilities of play. Parents often bring their children to the library with the purpose of reading or borrowing media. It is important to inform parents that play culture is part of the library service. A way to involve the parents is to appeal to their inner child and to make it clear that playing is both allowed and encouraged at the library. It's a good thing for families to play together. When families play, adults and children have different competences that they can use together in, in the purpose of playing. Parents know something about playing, and children know something else about playing. The librarian's best role is as observer or equal participant in the games. We must show that playing has a place at the library through our attitude and behavior. Saying yes to play is to say yes to noise and clutter. Colleagues, management, and users in the library must accept that play creates more noise and clutter. Working with families at play in the library is about showing the library not as a repository for the modern family, but as a place for experiences and adventures. Yes. So this was the second part. And again, I would encourage you to turn to your next neighbor and just try to comment and see if that has any bearing in your environment.
Well, well, this time I didn't lie to you. I didn't tell you how long time you had. You don't have any more time. We are proceeding. Yesterday we heard BK say that the library should orient itself towards things that were ungoogleable. Ungoogleable. Good expression. So if we look at the library now, we could say that we need to think about the space of the library from something that has to do with uh, something you can't find on Google or Google as F. So you need to think about what can you do with the space? Can you use the space as a media? Can you add significance and meaning to the space? Yesterday, I had the opportunity to look at the library here in Thomaston North. That was a very good experience because a lot of thinking had gone into how to create sort of the living room of the city. And it really worked. That, that, is, that is meaningful use of space. So you need to think along those lines. User involvement. You have to put up networks and work together with the people around you. Also internationally and nationally, if you can, if you have the opportunity. The methods that we have used in developing our, the idea of our new main library is, for instance, World Cafe format, where we do discussion rounds with users and where we get a picture of how other people perceive the library. And we get a lot of dialogue and we get our own competences challenged. We will have the opportunity to examine our own attitudes and ideas. Another method or format that we have used in developing the physical spaces is that we have had people equipped with cameras going around in the library taking photos of what they think was good and what is bad in the library and afterwards discussing that with staff, staff members, that is a very good method and gets a lot of discussion going and a lot of reflection done. We have done the village square model where we introduce ideas, we actually create ideas in this process and then we pitch the ideas in the process. Uh, that, that gives us a very good relation to the users' ideas and thoughts, and we can also test, uh, for instance, different uh, development topics in that, in that format. We use lead users. Our MindSpot uh, is, is a concept where we actually hire young people from university that has various competences. For instance, a guy who is very good at gaming, a guy who is, knows a lot of literature, a girl who can, who can uh, do things with the social networks and so on. We pay them for uh, around six hours per week and we use them together with our staff to go out to public schools or to create events or to go out to musical festivals and to represent the library in a different way. That has been a tremendous success. We have constructed a universe around the mind spot and gives us access to a network and to user groups that we didn't have before. For instance, right now we have a name competition on what is to be the name of the new main library that we are building. And we use these networks uh, of, the, of the young people together with the, uh, with the newspaper. We made a partnership with, with the newspaper of the town. So we got the few old people who are still reading a newspaper being active on creating names and on name ideas, and a lot of young people that came up with a lot of ideas in the network. We have uh, done children's labs uh, in, in connection with the main, uh, the development of the tender, the bid, the tender that we put out for the architectural competition. We had children uh, of between nine and 14 working for a week to come up with their ideas on what should this library be for them. That was a tremendous experience. And it, in the beginning, the architectural companies that would compete, they were pre-selected. We had 
six company competing. They thought we were crazy. But eventually, it dawned upon them that we were very serious about this. And they came back, also some of the companies that didn't win, and say that was a very good process, and they understood the meaning of it. That was great. So what have you learned in all these processes? What have we learned? We have learned that we need to make partnerships. We need to co-create and co-produce with the users. We need to integrate the user-generated knowledge in our services. And we need to liberate the library from the analog media graduate. We need to think value chains, formats, universes in our service production. We need to make space for prototyping in the library. And we need to increase the ties between other public sector activities and libraries. Much more relations, not so much transactions. And we need to be where the users are. So the programs and services that we have, first a little model of what you could call the makeup, uh, the mashup library. You know, a mashup is a sort of homepage where you get the resources from other homepages. So you just mash up. You don't actually create the services that are embedded in it yourself. It comes from somewhere else, so to speak. That is the basic idea between this model of a community center that we actually have stolen from UK. The idea is to see the physical space as a lot of services. And a lot of these services are actually generated from our partners. The services are within the premises of the physical library, but they're generated by somebody else, which is extremely important now because we don't have that much funding. We cannot create it ourselves, and we are not good enough at creating these services ourselves. So the concept of the mashup library is a very important one for us. Now, in that strategical report that I mentioned that came out two years ago, there is this sort of model of what a modern library is. It consists of four elements, four spaces. They can be physical, they can be mental, or they can be on the net. One is the space for inspiration, one is space for learning, there's a space for meeting, and there's a space for performance. Ah, you can't really see that. Let's see. But in the space for inspiration, I'll just go back. That is where you, uh, of course, get inspired, where serendipity uh, comes out. In the space for learning, you discover. In the space for meeting, it's a more democratic space. That's that, that is where you participate, where you discuss. And then sort of the new thing, all these other things, they are, they are well known in the library world. But the space for performance, that's where you create. Yesterday, we saw uh, BK talking about the hacker spaces. Spaces, where you make a spaces, as they are known in, in some American libraries now. They are spaces where you actu actually create. You could say that the top uh, part of the model has to do with cognition, information. Uh, the bottom has to do with engagement. The left side is about innovation. And the right side is about empowerment. This is it's a, that's a, a theory about this model that can be seen at the Royal School of Library and Information Science. But it's a good uh, model to have to think about. I tried to put some pictures on it. If you look at the space for ins inspiration, you can see this is the space for meaningful, moving experiences where you're emotional, chaotic, Storytelling, that is probably what Karen Schneider, who yesterday gave a good workshop on framing, would call where also the symbolic uh, frame could be. So that is where analog media, digital media, inspiration, music, serendipity, you get inspired, but also 
where in events takes place. All these pictures are from the library of Aarhus exhibition where you play puppet theater, chess club, where your imagination runs, book smart program, and storytelling is. If you look at the space for learning, that is where you explore, you get easy access to information and knowledge, maybe learning as a dialogue process, uh, of course, based on users' learning needs, you can create various formats for that. One is tuition, of course, structured courses will run in the libraries, informal learning, consultation, individual help, homework help for primary school and for immigrants. Edutainment is learning too. Word can go, guidance, self-learning, and self-service. So these are various formats for the learning space. And the meeting space is an open public space. You have, of course, heard of the great good place between home and work, the third place, uh, where you sort of come, where you also can have organized meetings and chat groups and so on. Meetings, talks, discussions, public debate, politics, this one. He was, he was a minister of justice in the previous government and Murphy is in the library. And of course, concentration is here. Space for performances, that is where we create as users. We publish and distribute. We do all kinds of uh, targeted workshops. Writers workshops, rep performances, building the future library, poetry slam, Creating toys, workshops for leader users, creating the future, methods development, Hacker Lab. Have Hacker Lab in the main library over a weekend. And of course, <laughs> the necessary work when it is good. So, just to sum up the elements for the strategy, we think that it's important to abandon the printed book as the primary library branding element. That is extremely important. We need to think about how we bring to together the physical and the digital world. We need to focus on development and bring new skills to the library and promote learning in the organization. This session of questions and comments, we will skip and go on to just a few words about the new main library in Aarhus, which is actually the largest construction uh, project in the history of Aarhus City.
this is where it's at. This is the construction site. So there's a way to go still. Lots of square feet. <coughs> uh, the vision is important. It's a place for human development and interaction, promoting experience, learning, innovation through a flexible and programmable, programmable building with a special focus on children and families. And this vision has been developed together with the citizens of Aarhus. There's nothing about books or about IT in the vision, which is important. Three times the existing area for the public, lots of space for children and families. I'll just skip uh, some of these pictures you saw from the movie. But this is going to be great. Just a brief look at the inside. That is, is this is the general purpose uh, hall with a library. Fantastic children's area. We are looking forward to this, as you can imagine. And then how it looks right now. <laughs> we have gained some recognition uh, from that. We're on the star CNN, actually, feature of libraries with or without books, French, Italian, and so on. Yeah, I think that was about it. What I wanted to say is only an advertisement that in 2013, June 16 to 19, we have the so-called Next Library Conference in Aarhus. I hope to see some of you there. You should consider to come. Thank you very much.